Hey, uh, we are in Acts chapter 24. If you have a Bible, you want to open up there for our message, Felix's Spiritual Procrastination. Procrastination is something that everybody can experience either in small degrees or large degrees. There are some people that are just really driven people, and uh, it's like do it now, do it proper. They don't procrastinate much about life. And then there are others who procrastinate procrastinate about everything. If they had an assignment in school, they put it off to the last day and stayed up till three in the morning. Or if they have a project, they uh, put it off to the very end. But procrastination, that desire to say manana to things, the desire to say tomorrow or next week or next month, I'll get around to it. You know, usually it doesn't have these, these overwhelming consequences. But when it comes to spiritual procrastination, as we'll see in this passage of scripture, it can be quite spiritually terrifying when you make the decisions that we see Felix make in this passage of Scripture. As we look at verses 1 through 27 of chapter 24, I'm going to move quite quickly at the beginning through the first 23 verses, commenting lightly. You'll see the charges that are brought uh, against Paul, which are unfounded and have no merit and really no teeth, if you will. They're not ones that are going to... Uh, harm Paul in any way, even though Felix is going to leave him in jail uh, for a couple of years. But the thing is, is that uh, as we get through this, I really want to spend our time together on this Sunday morning looking at Paul the Apostle's direct dialogue with Felix and Drusilla and their response to that, because I think that that's where the meat and potatoes of this passage is, and that's what we want to focus on, and to deal with the issue, whether it's in our own lives or the lives of other people when we're aware of it, of spiritual procrastination. And so we pick it up. Paul the Apostle has been arrested. He has been moved to Caesarea because of an assassination attempt on his life, and now the governor that he's been entrusted to is a guy by the name of Felix. And Felix is going to hear in a uh, courtroom setting now what I'm going to read. And so follow along, pay attention, don't go to sleep, no snoring during this first five minutes, okay, as we move to get to the good stuff. Here we go. Verse 1. Now after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. If he was from Idaho, he would be an orator, but that's another sermon. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation against Paul, saying, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always in all places, most noble Felix." With all thankfulness, nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. Tertullus does a little flattery to soften up uh, Felix to hear his charges against Paul. Here they are, verse 5. For we have found this man a plague. How would you like that to be your first charge? You're a plague. A creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander, Lysias, came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. So what they've said about Paul in these charges, official charges, he's a plague, He follows the sect of the Nazarenes or Jesus of Nazareth. He uh, is creating all of this dissension around the world. The Romans hated any kind of public disturbance. And also that he had tried to profane the temple by bringing a Gentile in there. That was their charge. Really didn't happen. It was false. And so those are their charges. He's a plague. He follows Jesus. He causes dissension wherever he goes. And um, he tried to profane the temple. None of those things do the Romans really care about. So now we have Paul's defense in verse 10. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may, because you may 
ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor exciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. So they, they can't prove these things, Paul said. But now Paul, in verse 14 through 16, has a fourfold confession that he is willing to make. And this is the fourfold confession that every born-again Christian should be able to make, want to make, and be passionate to make. Pay attention. Verse 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Paul says, the things that they're saying about me are untrue. But you know what is true about me? Number one, as far as following the way or following the Christian life or following Jesus Christ as my Savior, guilty as charged. I'm a follower of Jesus. Each one of us, if you're a born-again Christian, should be able to say that, want to say that, be passionate about your walk with Jesus as we see the model as a public confession and testimony by the great Paul the Apostle. Number one, I follow Jesus, don't care who knows it. He's my Savior, I'm following after him. If you can hang with that, great. And if not, then I don't know what to do for you, but that's what I'm doing. Number two, he says, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. So, At the end of verse 14, he says, I believe all of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. And Paul the Apostle is saying something that Jesus also believed. Everything that's contained in the Old Testament scriptures, the New Testament had not yet been written, he believed. Paul the Apostle believed that God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. Paul the Apostle believed that in the days of Noah, God asked him to build an ark and that he brought a flood for 40 days and 40 nights and he saved eight souls as he rescued them through the ark. Paul the Apostle believed the story that God prepared a great sea creature to swallow up his rebellious, pouty prophet Jonah and then throw him up on the shores so that he'd finally go to Nineveh like he was told to do. Paul the Apostle says, I believe all of the Old Testament. Do you believe that as a Christian? We are in a day and age where people challenge the word of God. Tammy and I some time ago got in a taxi cab and the guy asked me immediately what I did. I told him I was a pastor and he immediately said, well, you don't believe in Noah's Ark and Jonah and the whale. And I said, yeah, I most certainly do. Oh, those are myths. Those are, those are fabrications. Those are, those are Stories. I said, well, they may be to you. I was thinking to myself as an unbelieving pagan on his way to hell, they may be to you. <laughs> but they're not to me. They're, they're the word of God. And speaking of that, shortly after that, Tammy gave him the heaven or hell speech and she just went right for the jugular. It was amazing. But... <laughs> Be that as it may, there are people, whether it's a taxi cab driver or a friend or a university professor that will challenge those things. And you say, well, I believe in Jesus, but not all the stories of the Bible. Do you know that Jesus Christ, the son of the living God that took on human flesh, talked about Noah and the flood? And that he talked about Jonah, and as Jonah was three days and three nights in the the belly of the great sea creature or the fish, that he was going to be in the heart of the earth? Do you know that you can't believe in Jesus And not believe the truth of the scriptures that he endorsed unless you want to have some kind of schizophrenic type of relationship with God? Do you follow Jesus? Do you believe the scriptures really teach what they teach in truth? Paul the Apostle does. He also says, I have this hope in the resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust. Paul said, there is a resurrection coming and I believe it. That death here on this planet doesn't end life. It actually just moves it to a new chapter. And that there's the resurrection of the just, those who know and love God, and those who don't know and love God and will be eternally separated from God. And lastly, he says, since I know all of this stuff, I strive to be without offense in my relationship with God vertically and with my relationship with fellow man horizontally. That's the heart of every Christian. I want to love God with all my heart, greatest commandment, to love my neighbor as myself. Notice this fourfold confession is so powerful, so succinct, so dynamic, so power-packed, you can't miss it. And who's he laying it on? Felix, the governor, 
and Ananias and all the religious leaders. He said, you want to charge me with something? Be accurate in what you charge me with. I believe in Jesus. I believe all of the scriptures. I believe in the resurrection. And I'm trying to live a life without fence towards a God and man. He goes on in verse 17. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with a tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. He's like, where are the witnesses? Verse 20, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. And we saw that last week. Goes on in verse 22. Now, uh, but when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, or Christianity, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. That is the short, brief chronology of this little trial or case before Felix that I wanted to get through quickly. So if some of you zoned out, we read a lot, and you're about ready to come back right now. Come back to me. Come back. Thank you. Listen, may I have your attention? Attention, please. Now I want to talk about this incredible, Paul just gave a dynamic four-fold confession that every Christian should be able to make. Now he's going to give a three-point sermon that will rock anybody's world. It says in verse 24, after some days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul, listen, He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. After some days, Felix is talking to his wife, Drusilla, which just a brief history, a little snapshot about these two very nefarious, uh, evil characters, Felix and Drusilla. Felix was historically has uh, the station in life as a guy that was a slave that was set free that actually held a high Roman office because his brother, Paulus, who was also a slave that was set free, was a childhood friend of Claudius Caesar. Claudius Caesar, through Paulus' request, put Felix in this place. Now, Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, didn't care much for Felix, and so his statements about him are kind of caustic. He said he was in the position of a king, but he ruled like a slave, meaning he was really a brutal guy. Now, when Drusilla appears is uh, between 16 and 19 years old here, she had actually is the daughter of King Agrippa I, the guy that was eaten with worms back in chapter 12. That was her dad. And he had set up a prearranged marriage for her to marry some other uh, royalty. And, but when Felix saw her and met her, he got a magician historically involved and told her basically that God wanted her to be with him. So he stole her from that marriage, and now they had, it says his wife, but it was kind of an adulterous, mixed-up situation. So here's a girl that was raised Jewish, 19 years old. Felix is older, and they decide, you know, as a couple, they're going to hear about this faith in Christ. So they call for Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle comes in and it says he reasoned with them. It means they dialogued. They would ask questions. He would share the truth about who Christ is and, and what he had done and how he, had, he was God in human flesh and lived a sinless life and performed miracles and raised the dead and healed the, bl- the, the blind and the lame and walked on water and fed the 5,000 and all those things, but ultimately died on the cross for the sins of the world, was buried and rose from the dead. Paul shares all of that with him, the gospel, and then he zeroes in on these three thoughts. Three-point sermon. First point in this sermon is about righteousness. He no doubt says, hey, are you guys righteous? Do you think God will accept you because the God in heaven is a righteous God? What's it mean to be righteous? Righteousness is doing the right thing from God's perspective or getting into heaven the right way. The only way of righteousness to get into heaven is through faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. 
That's what it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God. Notice this, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. God makes no distinction. You're Jew, you're Greek, you're young, you're old, you're bad, you're good, you're male, you're female, you're a slave, you're free. doesn't matter who you are. This is the method in which you can have a righteous access to heaven. God's a holy God, and you can't get in by many roads, or there's a lot of different ways, or if you're just a good person, or you haven't done many bad things. You know, many Americans just believe it is their heritage to go to heaven because they're born in a country whose foundation was Christian in nature, and because you got a dollar bill in your pocket that says, in God we trust. That's not how you get to heaven. You get to heaven by putting your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. So you should be able to say this. I am a righteous person, not because of the good things that I have done, because I've been a bad person. I am a righteous person because I have placed my faith and trust in the righteous one who accomplished and finished the work of salvation for all lost sinners. I like what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says. Speaking of Jesus, it said, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So through faith in him, if, it, it, and when I ask people, hey, are you right with God? Are you righteous with God? They say, well, I go to church or I have a Bible or I give or I'm kind or I give to charities. None of those things that you're talking about, it may be a practical righteousness, but there's two things in the Christian life. There's a positional righteousness where you're right with God by faith in his son, and then sanctification begins and you begin to live a right life. We come to church because it's a place where we can grow. We can worship the Lord, learn the Bible, and grow. But just coming to church in itself doesn't save you, right? I mean, going to McDonald's does not make you a Big Mac. (laughs) Coming into this building does not make you a Christian. It's something you have to receive by faith that Jesus Christ is your Savior. So he's straight up. He's dialoguing with the governor, Felix, and his wife, Drusillus. Hey, you guys righteous? You right with God? You know know how to get to heaven? And they're just sitting down, you know, rock back on this. Well, I don't know about this righteousness. Oh, it's through faith in this Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. And they're going back and forth. and, And it's kind of blowing their mind. Number two, Paul builds upon that. He says, you know, once you experience a right relationship with God, the natural fruit of that is the fruit of self-control, which an unsaved person doesn't have, the fruit of the spirit of self-control. When you want to sin, you just sin. You want to lie, you lie. You want to be greedy, you're greedy. You want to be selfish, you're selfish. You want to be angry and hostile, you are. You want to be foul-mouthed, you are. You want to be drunk, you are. You want to do drugs, you do. There's no self-control operating in your life. But when you come to Christ, all of a sudden there's a newfound power of the Holy Spirit. That There's a fruit of the spirit of, of self-control. And so he talks to him about this. Hey, you guys righteous with the Lord? And, and as a result of that righteousness, or do you have self-control in your life that you're now doing or living a right life from God's perspective? Now, sometimes that's a little confusing to people. First of all, we just read the passage in Romans about how you can be right with God through faith in his son. That's how all of us have to approach God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But number two, look at the contrast. Paul paints such a contrast. I don't think you can do a better job than that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 26. And it says in Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 19, it describes the life without God. Now this would describe, who would this describe? Felix and Drusilla. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident. That means it's obvious to everybody who's living in a sinful life. Which are, what are they? Adultery, that's a no-brainer. Fornication, any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage or prior to marriage. Uh, Uncleanness and lewdness, those are both sexual charged terms. We don't have time to get into it. Adultery, uh, excuse me, idolatry. Sorcery, which is cultic behavior based in drug use. It's the word where pharmakia, where we get pharmaceutical drugs. It's, It's the drug use of its day. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresy, envy, murders, Uh, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. It's like he just stops. There's a long list. I'm not going to give you the complete one. You got to, you you tuning in? You got a little feel for it? That's, That's what it looks like to be without Jesus. And what does he say about that? Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. People that live like this, without righteousness, without self control, without a relationship with God, this is what their life looks like and they will not go to heaven, okay? 
He's talking to Felix and Drusilla about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. But then we see the, a different picture. Somebody gets saved. You get transformed by the grace of God. And then the fruit of the Spirit comes in your life and you become a new person. In verse 22 it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, excuse me, against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Those are two contrasting lifestyles. The first list looked a lot like me before I came to Jesus. I don't know about you. I can find myself in that list. And the second list looks more like me than it used to. Looks a lot more like me. I have more love and joy and peace. It doesn't mean I don't still struggle with the temptations to the first list. That might trouble some. Well, I still am tempted towards fill in the blank, the list up there. But I struggle. That key word is struggle. You never struggled with it before. You just did it. But now you're a Christian and you have conviction and the Holy Spirit's on the inside, right? And you're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to do that anymore. Because now there's a tug of war going on because you sincerely have the spirit of the living God in you. Now, as he lays that out, he says, are you guys right with God? Are you righteous? Have you believed in Christ? Do you have the fruit of righteousness, which is a life of self-control that turns away from the life of sin? Self-control is the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to say no to the wrong things and yes to the right things. That's what we need help with. Don't you need help? I need help with that every day of my life. Lord, help me by your power to live right, do the right things I need to do, and not do the wrong things that I'm tempted to do. So Paul the Apostle, one, two punch, now here comes the right cross. Now he talks to him about the judgment to come freaks them out. There is a judgment to come. Did you know that? There's a resurrection of the just and the unjust. People will argue this point. How could a God of love send anybody to hell? This is an age-old argument that usually tips over most Christians because when the world charges it, let me just give you a couple simple apologetic answers to that. Number one is, if you've heard the gospel, you are choosing to reject that and go to hell yourself, number one. You, you are making that choice. God is not sending you there. You don't want his answer and his remedy for forgiveness, so you're choosing your own way. Number two, obviously a God that is holy and a creator has a sense of holiness and justice, and he must judge sin. Even you and I created in his image, when some atrocity happens to a little kid, you just get enraged. Man, there should be judgment. There should be punishment for that. Why? Because you're created in the image of God, and if you and I, in a fallen sinful nature, expect justice on planet Earth... How much more is the holy God of the universe going to hold people accountable to bring them to heaven if they believe in his son or send them to hell if they reject the hope and the opportunity? Lastly, on this subject of judgment, let me share this with you. That Jesus, the Father so loved the world that he says, it, we, we see it in um, this passage of Scripture, um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants you to be saved. And then 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is longsuffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. What's the heart of God? He wants you all to be saved. He wants you all to come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as your Savior. But ultimately, if you want, if you're bent, if you're, if you're, if you're decided to get to hell because you want to reject the only remedy and answer for hell, it's as if the Lord Jesus standing in your way had said, you can go to hell over my dead and resurrected body. Meaning, I've done everything for you, man. You don't have to go. You don't have to go. So a God of love, first of all, gives people opportunity to believe. And you say, well, what about the people who have never heard the gospel? This is a great question. What about the people that have never heard the gospel? Well, Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2 answers this question. Romans chapter 1 says... Men and women are without excuse because the Godhead is represented in the creation around them. When people look at the mountains and they look at the, the, this beautiful world and the universe and its, its preciseness and they know an intelligent being designed it, they know there's a God. Creation outside testifies there is a God in the heavens. Number two, G Romans chapter two says, and there's a conscience within knowing good and evil, either excusing us or accusing us if we're right or we're wrong. So, 
people, and this is what the Lord says through Paul in Romans chapter two, those who uh, have lived without the law, they'll be judged without the law. Those who have lived with the law, they'll be judged by the law. Meaning the amount of information you have is the criteria by which God makes the decision about your soul. So nobody's off the hook. The creation outside, the conscience within, the, the information. Let me tell you, there is nobody in this room with all the information you're going to get this morning that is off the hook. <laughs> because you got all the goods today. You can't say, oh, I didn't know I slept through that service. No, remember I woke you up just a little while ago <laughs> to tune you in for the important stuff, right? That's what we did. Okay. So having said that, Having said that, what is the reaction of Felix? He just heard about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And these three, this three-point sermon has rocked his world. It tells us in verse, um, at the end of verse 25, Felix was afraid. The King James, he trembled. Man, he shook in his sandals and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Now we see four steps of procrastination or putting off the message you just heard. Number one, fear without repentance. You know, I can, people come to church and they'll get freaked out by a message like this and they'll talk to me afterwards and they'll have a tear in their eye or they'll be motivated in this, but they never come to Christ. Emotional impact without spiritual renewal is worse because now you know, you have more information, okay? So, there's fear without repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10 tells us what real repentance looks like. It says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Meaning that, man, when my world's rocked, the, the worst thing you can do when God, when, when the Lord impresses his word on you or you're struck by a conviction or a spiritual truth, the best thing you can do is immediately want to yield, surrender, and apply it to your life immediately. Because every time you say no, you harden your heart. Have you ever had this experience that there was something you said you wouldn't do and then you did it? And that first time you did it, oh, you felt terrible and you can't believe you did it and you said for years you would never do this, fill in the blank. But then once you did it, man, it was such a battle and you were in such anguish and afterwards you were so guilt-ridden, but the next week you did it again and oh, well, it wasn't didn't feel quite as bad about that. And then in a month, and well, a year from then, there's no compunction whatsoever in your conscience because you've embraced it as the new norm. But at first, oh, you are overwhelmed with the gravity of the wrong that you've just done. And so in that experience, he does not act on the emotional impact that he was afraid the fear of God came upon him through a powerful three-point sermon from the anointed Paul the Apostle. And number one, fear without repentance is no good. Delay, delay always leads to destruction. For it goes on to say, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. You see what he thought, when I have a convenient time, maybe I want to believe in the Lord in a week or a day or, or next month or next year. You know, you've given me the information, but, you know, down the road I can do that at any time, and, which theoretically partially is true, that you can do that any time in the future, but this is the thing. You may not want to do it in the future because your heart, heart gets hard. That's what people don't get. Oh, I can do this later, or, you know, when I'm older, I want to have my fun now, whatever it is. You delay and then you don't want to hear. Listen to what the Bible says about, and just so that you understand this biblical principle, today is always the Lord's, and tomorrow is always the devil's. Act today. Today is the Lord's, tomorrow is the devil. Hey, we, we have it in the simplest thing of a, a diet. Any of you want to lose weight after the new year, please don't raise your hand. You know, we, through the year, maybe we went on vacation, and I've had this happen. I gained five pounds, and I, I feel you know, I, I don't want to have that five pounds, so I determined that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my eating habits for the next 30 to 60 days so that I can lose that weight that I just gained. But then that night, there's a great meal, and I go, oh, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow. I'm going to start tomorrow. Well, you know, Monday. How about, you know, how about March? Let's start in March. Let's just, you know, because my taste buds just love food, you know what I mean? And so I'm always, there's nothing that I like to delay more than, you know, eating good now and worrying about it tomorrow. But in spiritual things, what's, what's the consequence of delaying a diet? Well, maybe a couple of unwanted pounds not getting off as fast as you want. What's the consequence of delaying the living God and his message of hope and salvation? 
eternity. Eternity. There's a big difference, folks. Spiritual procrastination. Listen to this. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, strengthening that point I just mentioned, that today is the time. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today. Today is the day of salvation. Respond now. And that would be the truth to Felix. And then Hebrews 3, verse 7 and 8 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. Man, if the Holy Spirit speaks to you today and you hear his voice, don't harden your heart or say no or say manana or maybe later. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly party, pardon, party. <laughs> when you're pardoned, it is a party. Okay, so he will abundantly pardon. But what is it? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon the Lord while he is near. What's that mean? Isn't God always near? In his presence, God is omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at once. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. But you see, what Isaiah is saying is what we're seeing in the life of Felix. You see, call now. Come now. Repent now. Because tomorrow's the devil's. And you may not want to call upon the Lord. You may not sense his nearness another time. In a crowd like this, no doubt there is someone in this room that this is your absolute last call and opportunity for salvation. Just God's been calling. The parents have shared with you. The grandma and grandpa shared with you. You went to vacation Bible school when you were young. You've had every opportunity. You have went to a youth group camp. You had a friend that shared the gospel with you. You've read the Bible at different times. You've read a tract. You have more information than the, than the average human being on planet Earth, and you have said no, and you have said no, and you have said no. And when the Holy Spirit spoke to you, you hardened your heart as they did against the Lord in the wilderness, and you said today is not the day. It's manana. It's tomorrow. And you did not call upon the Lord while he may be found and while he was near. And God in his love and grace, as he says in Genesis 6, my spirit shall not always strive with man. There is a day we know not when, there is a time we know not when, when the human soul says no for the last time on this planet to the lordship and the salvation and the forgiveness of the righteous and holy one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord's a total gentleman. He says, okay. It's the way you want it, man. You want to be the tough guy? You want to be the hard-hearted girl? That's the way you're going to roll? Okay. I'm done calling. One of the most sobering passages of Scripture to me in all the book of Proverbs is found in chapter 1. Look at it with me, starting at verse 23 through 33, is that the Lord expresses himself about this subject. Listen to it. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. That's God's heart. I will make my words known to you. That's what God wants to do. Because I have called and you refused, I stretched out my hand that no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despise my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own doing, be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But, oh, I love this word, but, but whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. God says, you know, you've said no to me one, too many times in this passage of Scripture. And he said, okay, it's a done deal. Now I'm gonna laugh from heaven. I'm gonna mock you from heaven. When you go through your disasters and all of a sudden you wanna to turn to me, you wanna call out to me, you're crying out to me. He says, I'm not gonna listen. Now, I'm convinced that as long as there's breath in your lungs and there's blood pumping through your heart, that I'm always praying and hoping that there's opportunity. But life and experience and 
and people saying no to the Lord, I have watched people that no longer want to hear about God all the way into the grave. And they've went through hardships and trials and there was no comfort from God. There was no intervention from God. There was no activity because God, you know what? He's a gentleman and he gives you your space. And so if you're here and you're kicking and screaming like, I don't like this. I don't want to hear about Jesus. I don't want to go to heaven. I don't even know why I'm in church on Super Bowl Sunday. You know what? Maybe this is that last call for you. That last call for you. Bob Vernon was on the L.A. police force. And if you've ever heard Bob Vernon speak, he's a, he's a powerful speaker because he uses all these police stories. And he said when he was a young sergeant over a crew, he uh, had showed up on the scene where a guy was dead. And uh, he went over to a bystander to ask his report because his, one of his police officers on his squad had shot and killed the guy. And so he had to, as a sergeant on duty, he had to follow up on that. And so he went over and uh, he asked first his officer what happened. The officer told him. And he said, are there any witnesses? And the officer said, that, that Jesus freak over there. And he said, the Jesus freak, which struck him funny because he was a Christian also. And so he's like, well, I guess I'll go over here and talk to the Jesus freak. So, so he went over and he talked to the guy. And, and, and he was just, you know, really rattled like, oh, Lord, have mercy. And, and Bob Vernon just, you know, in a very professional way said, sir, can you tell me what happened? He goes, oh, it was amazing. And he goes, you know, I'm a Christian. And he, and he said, I've never had anything like this happen to me at all. But he said, this guy was sit out here sitting on the curb. You see, this guy had just uh, robbed a store and he had a gun on him and he had robbed the store and he had ran away. And there he was sitting on the curb. And this Christian said, I've never been impressed like this in my whole life by the spirit of God. The Lord just said, go share the gospel with this guy one more time. And so he said, I, I went up to him and I said, hey, you know, I, I, I feel a little awkward. I don't know you, but uh, the Lord's really impressed on my heart to, to share with you about the love of Jesus. Can I do that? And the guy looked at him kind of soberly and said, yeah, why don't you go for it? And so he said, hey, God loves you, and Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and if, I don't know what your life's all about, but, you know, if you want to come to Christ, I'd love to pray with you right now, and you could give your life to Christ and know your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven. And the guy thought, and he was kind of quiet for a moment, he said, you know, I've, I've rejected him a number of times, and, and I'm going to reject him now. But you know what? I want to thank you for sharing that with me. And right then, as soon as he shared and he took a step away, the police cars pulled up in front, jumped out. This guy pulled out a gun, and the cops shot him right there within seconds. And he said, God loved that guy so much, he threw a lifeline to him one more time right before he died seconds later. Isn't that the grace of God? The guy had a shot. But in his heart, I've rejected him a number of times. Don't need him. You know, there are those who have that perspective in their hearts and their attitudes. Well, lastly, the last two things there was a step down that he was afraid, fear without, without repentance. Then there was procrastination, not considering the consequences. And then there was greed for money rather than the experiencing of spiritual wealth. He was hoping that Paul would, would uh, uh, basically bribe him so he could set him free from jail. So he called for him the more often. So when he called for him the more often to dialogue, he kept, you know, hoping that he would grease his palm with a bribe so that he'd get out. But Paul only has one subject. You know, you call for him, so, hey, you want to talk about the Lord some more? So... Let's, let's talk about the Lord some more. And so then greed, his, his desire got centered on the money. And then lastly, we see this fourth step away in procrastination for Felix. And that is he would rather please man than God because it says at the end of verse 27, wanting to do the Jews a favor, he left Paul bound. He would rather please the Jews rather than doing the right thing. Paul's innocent. All he has to do is set him free. That's all he has to do. Set him free. Don't worry about the Jews. Do the right thing from God's perspective. Be the kind of governor he should be. But he cared more about what people think than about what God thinks and about doing the right thing. Do you care more about what your brother or sister or your mom or your dad or your aunt or your uncle or your high school best friend, do you, do you care more about what they think than what Jesus Christ thinks? Do you realize if you're here today and you know you have to get right with the Lord, one of the thoughts that has held you back is the thought, well, I'd like to give my current life to Christ, but my best friend to my right, we've been friends since we were kids, and, and, and I, don't, I don't know what he would do if I did that. Would we not be friends anymore? Maybe it's a husband or wife. You're, you're here and you want to receive Christ, and, and you're a woman, but you think, I know my husband's in church this morning, but I don't think he's going to give his life to Christ. And Can I boldly give my life to Christ and experience the tension that will come if he doesn't give his life to Christ? Can I cut through that foggy place for you and bring you out into the clear daylight and share with you that your soul is on the line and one day you will stand before God alone with no family member, 
no best friend, no spouse, no mom or dad, no cousin, no brother. And that the most important decision of your life is to receive and open up your life to the goodness and the love of Jesus to experience his forgiveness in eternal life and let the chips fall where they may relationally. Jesus said, some people think I came to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. You see, when you get saved, I realize all of a sudden my friends didn't care much about me <laughs> and people didn't want to hang out with me anymore because my lifestyle began to change. And I want to just invite you right now. I want to invite you to open your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ if you have not. And maybe you've put him off a number of times and, and, and maybe you've just said no or maybe you're not sure whether you're forgiven or not. I want to invite you to pray with me at the end of this service and to receive Christ and his forgiveness and the hope of heaven that you might have. But can I share with you in a, a loving, pastoral way, don't say manana to the Lord. Don't say tomorrow. Don't say next week. Don't say when I'm older next month. Because who knows if your heart's going to be in the soft place like it is this morning ever again in your entire life. Ever again. It may be. I'm not saying I know. I'm just saying Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Don't reject it one more time after you've heard it for the umpteenth time. Imagine that meeting. When you one day stand before God, if you've rejected the Lord before the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, and the verses that lead up to that, it says the Lamb's book of life is opened up. And if your name's not in that because of faith in Christ, it says the other books are opened up. And those other books contain every sinful thought and action and deed and dark or public or pe things that you thought nobody knew, all recorded in heaven. And that is the incriminating evidence that you are a lost human and you are not perfect and you are flawed and you are sinful and you did not avail yourself of the only remedy that would cover that sin. Man, when your name's in the Lamb's book of life, your name's there and it's covered in the blood of Jesus, and you know what's stamped next to your name? Righteous through faith in my son. I pray that that's where your name's at. Let's pray. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would just do what only you can do, and that is, Father, draw, draw people to yourself through your precious son, Jesus. Father, we ask that as I just pray that your Holy Spirit would move in this room, I, I ask for men and women, young and old, that you would just draw them to yourself. And Lord, that there would be no spiritual procrastination this morning. If your heart's desire is to know beyond a shadow of a doubt Jesus is your Lord and you're forgiven and you're on your way to heaven, I want to just invite you to pray with me this simple prayer at the end of this service. In the quietness of your own seat, right where you're at, just to give your heart to the Lord. Just pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I'm tired of fighting you tired of running from you. I'm tired of being angry with you. I'm tired of resisting you. I believe you died on the cross for me and that your blood washes away my sins and that you rose from the dead three days later and conquered death. Lord Jesus, I confess I need you. Would you be my Savior, my Lord, my King, my Master? I ask that you give me the power of the Holy Spirit to give me the strength to live for you. And I declare today, you're the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.